Hi, my name is Ben Himmelfarb, and I'm at El Centro Hispano to meet with Isabel Elsa Villar and record a story for People and Stories, the White Plains Public Library Oral History Project. So, good afternoon, Isabel. Good afternoon, Ben. I came to this country uh, 48 years ago, in 1966. Mm -hmm. I am a political refugee from Cuba mm -hmm. that came to this country looking for freedom. I didn't have the chance to get an education there because before I finished my high school, a month before, mm -hmm. the government expelled me from high school because I was going to church. So I came here, and at the time of coming, the whole family was going to come. My father, my mother, my brother, my sister, and myself. Castro established a law that all the boys between 15 and 27 could not leave Cuba because of the military service. At that time, my brother was only 14. But when we got to the airport, they said, how old is he? And my father said, 14. And the, the person at the airport said, well, he doesn't go because he's going to be 15 next year. And therefore, he's part of the law. So right there at the airport, we had to divide our family. And my brother said at that time, he was only 14, he said, Dad, I'll stay free with you. Let the women go. Mm -hmm. So we left. My mother, my sister, and myself, and my father, and my brother stayed behind. Mm -hmm. Why White Plains? Why I came to White yes, Plains? that was my next question. Because <laughs> uh, my uncle, uh, that was a doctor, um, a doctor, no, a professor in Cuba of the University of Havana, mm -hmm. at the beginning, in 1959, mm -hmm. He saw that this was going to come communism and everything, so he said, I am leaving. So he came to New York. He knew how to speak English. Yeah. He came to New York, to Greenwich Village, because he had a friend. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't like the big city, so he had a friend that invited him. And the friend said, well, there's a place called Westchester <laughs> County, up the, up the, the Harlem line in the train, right. that they have beautiful possibilities of work. So, sure enough, he came and he got jo a job working at Westchester Hill Country Club. Mm -hmm. He fell in love with White Plains and he was able to get out, um, to take out my aunt mm -hmm. that he had married in Cuba before coming in here. Mm -hmm. And she came in 62. And uh, when this happened in 66, we came to White Plains. Right, so and, came straight uh, here. Came straight here. Okay. And I have to tell you that uh, we came to White Plains with the clothes on our back as a typical immigrant, political mm -hmm. refugee. Mm -hmm. uh, even my mother, when everything was happening at the airport, my mother had a wedding band like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the militia said there, no, 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 you cannot go to the United States with that. So she had mm -hmm. to do like this and give it to them so that you can imagine how we left our country. We came to White Plains and we were living. They had a, they rented a house in Fervis Avenue and I called the Fervis Avenue the immigration, the immigrants, because it has been Italians, right. it has been Irish, and then now black and now Mexican. So everybody have gone through the <laughs> same melting pot. Yeah. So we came and my, uh, my aunt had three kids and us and three of us. Mm -hmm. So we were living in two bedroom apartment on the second floor and we were sleeping in a room, five people. Mm -hmm. And we were like, were like that for the first two months of our life until we found a little apartment right here in Grove Street next to the projects. And mm -hmm. my mother got a job. My mother was, and I, and I got a job. And I didn't know a word of English. Yeah, how, how old were you? I time? was 18 at that time. Okay. So I got a job working at Alexander's department store. What sports authority is right, right now? It's, uh, you know, the... Westchester, right? Next to the Westchester, okay? Yeah. That used yeah. to be all Alexander's, three right. floors there. I don't know if you're from White Plains. So I became a cashier because yeah. they did a, a math test and I was very good in math. Mm -hmm. So the first words, the word that I learned in English for the job was next. Next, next, <laughs> and next, and next. So that's how I began, and uh, I went to school, White Plains High School, not a word of English, and uh, I was sitting in the back of the room because at that time there were not even ESOL programs, English as a second language. Were there other Cuban immigrants not at all. here? Or not at all. There were speaking? few Hispanics, but people that were born here and they knew English perfect. 
my friends at that time were the kids that were in the Spanish class that knew how to speak Spanish. But I felt very bad. I was very isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, I was coming from a small environment and I was thrown in the Hawaii Plains High School with 2,500 students. And at the time was the time of the civil rights movements here. Nice. And that high school was an incredible place. I have never seen the riots. And I was caught in the middle of the riot and mm. I didn't know what was happening. I could not understand what they were chanting. Mm. And it was the time of the 60s in the United States. And, it, mm. you know, one of the kids took a shoe off and threw the shoe right on the principal's head. I will never forget. Oh. It was very rough. Mm. So I used to go home crying. I said, Mom, I don't want to go back to that crazy school, that wild school. Mm. And she used to take me back to school. And she said to me, remember the experience. Learn from experience. Mm -hmm. Look what happened to us. We had to leave everything behind. But the only thing that nobody can take away from you is what you have in your head. Mm. So she was my inspiration. Mm. And uh, I said, you're right. So I began there in the Plains High School, learned, learned Spanish and English. Mm. And I was very close to my counselor. So I said to my counselor, I want to go to college. Please help me. So uh, he said, I'm going to help you, but you have to help yourself, of course. So. Manhattanville College, you know Manhattanville College, yes. it was a sacred heart and I was in sacred heart in Cuba before Castro finished with all the uh, Catholic schools in Cuba. Right. So that was my inspiration, but I had to have good grades. So I was able to sneak out of the country a transcript before they threw me out. Mm -hmm. And the transcript went from Havana to the Swiss embassy in, uh, in some place, and then I was able to get it. Hmm. So I used that to Manhattanville to tell them that I was a smart, right. that I had the knowledge, the only thing is that I needed English, and I was number three in my class. Hmm. So I was able to get in, and I got a full scholarship to go to Manhattanville. Wow. So I was very lucky. And then I was going through the identity crisis that I told you at the high school because I didn't know what I was. I was not used to this kind of thing. I was not used to this uh, environment and I was very disappointed. What, so, what disappointed you? I thought that the United States uh, was, you know, the way that they, they talk about it, the land, that everything is fine and everything. And when I got here that I saw all these social problems. I mean, I was coming from a revolution in Cuba. To come here was another revolution that I was not expecting. Mm -hmm. So I'm very Catholic. So I mm -hmm. said to myself, I have to find a church. Just when I came in, they told me there is a Spanish mass right here in San Bernard. Mm -hmm. So I began coming to church to Spanish mass. The church became my refuge, my shelter. Um, my, yeah, my refuge and my shelter. And the place that I could come and look for so, you know, I know music, so I became involved with the choir. I became the director of the Spanish choir. I graduated from Manhattanville, and I got a job in teaching in Connecticut because here at that time, 1972, there were no jobs available. So I went to teach in Norwalk, Connecticut, middle school. Mm -hmm. The meanwhile, we have more Hispanics coming to the city. At that time when I came in, there were about, I would say about a 1,000 Hispanics in the area. How do I know it? Because uh, uh, in 1974, when I opened the center, when we opened the center, mm -hmm. I did a need assessment of the community, like a little census, and we were able to get to about a thousand people, so probably two thousand people. Mm -hmm. They were mainly Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. Spaniards from Spain, mm -hmm. and many Cubans that they came here for political reasons, and they were Colombians. Dominicans, Peruvians, but a small pockets of people. Right. So, in 1973, one day the priest calls me because he said that there is a lady that wanted to establish a program to help the ever-growing Hispanic community in town, and he wanted for me to do it. So I said, Father, I have my career as a teacher. As a teacher. Right. So he said, don't worry, you can do it. What we can do is anything that we do, We'll do it in the afternoons when you come from Connecticut and you can continue here. And I was tempted to say no. Mm -hmm. But I thought to myself, you know, I was so grateful to this country for giving me, number one, the refuge to come here, mm -hmm. for 
for giving me the education that I was not able to get in my country. Mm-hmm. And for giving the scholarship to be able to study that I said, I'm going to give it a shot. If I can contribute a little thing to this country and to, to help the people that, you know, are going to need the help, the same help that I was able to get, I wanted to be able to give it back. The whole thing was to give back, even though in, I was not even thinking about giving back. It was just the way I felt. So we meet and, okay, we are going to begin and this church is going to give facil- be giving the facilities. This lady that came that was representing our organization had a little salary, a little stipend, and that's how we began here. Was there what made the church take a special interest in this because, in that community? Because we, the, the our pastor, brilliant man, um, man that was uh, heading the ecumenical uh, things in uh, Philadelphia that, that was there, he saw that the community was growing and growing and growing, and he told me before you realize it, this town is going to have a lot of Hispanics, so we better be ready because they're all Catholics. Mm-hmm. So that's how, and we began. We began here, uh, uh, January thirty first, uh, nineteen seventy four, mm-hmm. and I kept on my job and uh, came here in the afternoon. Coming in the afternoon, we were open on Saturday, so I was going from seven o'clock to two o'clock there. Then I got here around two thirty. Went to my house, got something to eat. We opened the center at 3. I had somebody here at 3 until 9 o'clock every single night on Saturdays. So that's how we did it. Oh. And then the community began growing. I don't know if because people knew that we were here and they felt that, you know, one-stop place, you get a job, you get information about the apartments, you get uh, English classes. Sure. So we began having more people. Mm-hmm. Also, White Plains is the capital, the county seat, therefore... People were coming in here because there were a lot of restaurants and hotels and things that they could get job without being a professional. So that's how the expansion of the community. Right. I can tell you 74. By the 80s, it was 3,000. By the 90s, it was about 7,000 people. Uh, by, I think, 2000, it was about... 14,000, and by 2010, I think it was about, I don't know, about 17, 18,000 Hispanics. So you see how the... In the city of White Plains. In the city of White Plains only. Wow. Also, the demographics have been changing. The Spaniards, yeah. they went back to Spain right. after they retired. Yeah. The Cubans, they moved to Miami, yeah. or all the people. Just, the just Puerto Ricans... Know banging on the table and like, it's okay. <laughs> the Puerto Ricans, it was the urban renewal in the 80s and all these houses, all this uh, South Lexington was full of little houses mm-hmm. where all the Puerto Rican community used to live. Now they they demolished everything and right. they built all the buildings or they didn't build anything. Right. Therefore, the Puerto, they went either to Yonkers or they went back to, no, or they went to Orlando mm-hmm. or they went back to Puerto Rico. But then the Colombians began getting in here, and the Peruvians, and then Equatorians. In 1988 or 89, we began getting Paraguayans, and uh, we have a big Paraguayan population in the city of White Plains. Hmm. And then the ones that were almost, now I don't want to say the last ones to come, but now the ones that are more than anything else was in the 90s, the Mexican community. Mm-hmm. And now you have Mexicans all over the place. Right. So right now, the community is very diverse yeah. and it's very well represented. We don't have that many people from Central America. We have a little bit from Guatemala and from San Salvador. Is, but Panama, Nicaragua. Is there a reason that certain countries, people emigrate from certain countries at different times? My experience tells me it's because of a war. Every time that we have a totalitarian government mm-hmm. in a Latin American country, mm-hmm. we get the repercussions in here of people looking mm. for political freedom or for a job, economical situation. Safe so, place to live. Yes, yes. I remember when I was a teacher that suddenly we, we began getting kids from Nicaragua, and that's when the Sandinistas were in the power. 
Right. So always has been a reaction to something that has happened in Latin America. I see. So what else do I tell you? I mean, so uh, this here you serve people from so many different places and nationalities. So is there, is White Plains a place where like all those different nationalities live together or do, do people maintain together. separate they live to They live together, but at the same time, they maintain their own, it is, it is, it is, como se dice eso, idioma, it's, idiosyncrasies. Yes, yeah. yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I'm going to give you the, the example of the, the some people. The Peruvians are very involved with their church, not their church, their saint, our Lord of the Miracles, but they have uh, soccer mm -hmm. fields and soccer teams. Mm -hmm. The Paraguayans, they have their own uh, saint, but they have also very good with the soccer. Mm -hmm. And like that, I can tell you that all of them have different groups and they're good with that. But at the time of getting alone, I have been here for 40 years at the center and I can tell you that I haven't seen any kind of dispute mm. among different nationalities. Mm -hmm. The good thing about it is because there is not a one that is predominant and the other ones are suffering. Everybody more or less, mm -hmm. and they respect each other. That's why White Plains is so unique, so special, mm. because people are here and people are, many of these people have two jobs and, and, and they work very hard, but then they go to the church and they do the things that they're supposed to be doing. And uh, mm. they're all immigrants, mm. they two jobs. Um, my, about my life, I dedicated my life to this. I never got married, I don't have any kids. Uh, this has been, as I said, my baby all the time. Right now, Centro Hispano is helping and I am going to give you an annual report so you know sure. what we do. That'd be great. Um, 17,000 people a year because we have 25 programs. We have, this is, you see it, this is very small, but you, you, we have six satellite programs in four different schools in White Plains. Mm -hmm. In Stepinac, mm -hmm. Saturdays from 12 to four, we have two tutorial programs. Mm -hmm. At the White Plains High School, we have another one. At the Eastview School, we have two. Mi hermana mayor, my older sister, mi hermano, my, old, my oldest brother. We have 35 kids there. Mentorship, tutorial, any kind of help. And now our newest program is right here in the post row, kindergarten and first graders. Mm -hmm. So we have, even though we are small here, we are expanding ourselves, but we need more space, of course, and, uh, and that's something else. So, uh, what else? Ha have you found, like, um You've had to work with White Plains government? Oh, lot. yes, all the time. What is that experience? That was a very nice experience. I, 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 ten years ago, I was in ten different committees. Not ten, about five different committees with commissions in the city of White Plains. The Human Rights Commission of White Plains that doesn't exist now right. is about, I was there for 27 years. Mm. The comprehensive plan, I was there also. What's for the comprehensive plan? that uh, they have to do some kind of a planning department study oh, okay. about all the different departments and the well-being of the city of White Plains. And uh, they do a several, you know, every five, six years. Mm -hmm. So I was there for that time. Um, a member of the uh, Hispanic Day Parade that at that time was run by the city. Uh, I'm missing... One more that I don't remember. Oh, Community Development Grant. I was mm -hmm. an uh, uh, advisory board member for 37 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been very active in the city of White Plains. Uh, now uh, uh, I don't have any committees because now I am dedicated in here because we have grown on my time. It's a, but this is a very unique city, mm -hmm. very unique city. It's a very welcoming city. Mm -hmm. I have never felt here all kinds of ugly things that you see all over the place with uh, discrimination. Uh, I have a heavy accent. Mm -hmm. I have a heavy accent because, but I have three master's degrees, they're all hanging there. Mm -hmm. the, thing is that, <laughs> the thing is that when you come to learn a second language mm -hmm. after you are 14, 15 years old, it's very difficult for you to get rid of the accent. But that has not been at 
anytime, any kind of way to not allow me to portray myself mm -hmm. and to do the things that I to want to do. To participate. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I am only on the on the group of... Oh, and I used to be also a member of Recreation and Park many, many years ago. Mm. Uh, I am in, at the advisory board of uh, Hispanic uh, Festival Day that now is not run by the city. It's run by a group of volunteers <laughs> that uh, help to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still involved with that, and now we have programs with the City of White Plains. For example, on Sunday, we're going to have in here the City of White Plains, the planning department right here in the room that I'm going to show you, mm -hmm. because they're going to do a comprehensive plan. Mm. Um, I'm going to give you a copy in English. It's not a comprehensive. If it's a review of the consolidated plan, and they want to know what are the needs of the people in White Plains. I don't mm. know if you're interested in I am interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, it's going to be in Spanish, but I'm sure that things are going to be also in English. So, yeah. Well, I working at the library, I um, am s starting to use a little bit of Spanish and also realize I need to learn a lot more. Okay. Um, I, went, I went to SUNY Purchase. Oh, okay. And uh, I learned, you know, I took a year of Spanish there. Okay. Very small amount. Um, and, uh, you know, at the library, people constantly come in and either have questions about learning English or citizenship classes or, um, you know, or have questions about other things, but they speak Spanish. And uh, I, it's funny, I, um, I realize, like, it's, uh, it's not like people need to come here and just learn English, right? Like, people who are already here, we need to learn Spanish to help, you know, to, to welcome people. That's it. To, you're to right. Welcome. You're right. And you're a very a welcoming way. young person, and that, and that is very nice. And that's how I felt about White Plains. I mean, at the beginning, I didn't have any Hispanic friends. Mm -hmm. They were all Anglo friends that were from my uh, Spanish class, to the point that the day of the prom, prom mm -hmm. that I had, I went with an Anglo that became very close to me because, mm -hmm. that, you know, those are the people that I could relate more and, uh, mm -hmm. and I could um, be with. So I was interested to hear what you were talking about, about this being in White Plains in the era of the Civil Rights Movement in the late 1960s, um, and that there was, there was not really solidarity between African Americans and Hispanic. No, not, not there were no Hispanics, so we were right, not in that far. Yeah, yeah, we were. Just weren't enough people. Uh, I think that I met about five kids Hispanic in the whole high school. Mm -hmm. Yet African Americans, there were I don't know about at that time. I think it was about fifteen percent of the population. Sure. Now, yeah. it's all the way around. Now I think it's seventy percent, seven percent uh, blacks and uh, right. and uh, and twenty nine point six percent Hispanic. Mm. Am I right? Sure. <laughs> oh, I'll give you at the end the, the yeah, thing. Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah. So, so it has been an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult at the beginning, but after I graduated from college and I got my job, everything became better. I was not able to have a car, own a car, until I graduated from college. So mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of walking in yeah. white pants. And at that time, the snow was like this. <laughs> I decided one year in the summer that I was going to buy a bicycle. Mm -hmm. The bicycle only lasted until November that we began with the snow. That's too cold. So, yeah, too cold. Yeah. So I was very poor. Mm -hmm. I remember that since I, we didn't have any clothes, we didn't bring any clothes with us. I we went to. This is your first winter. Yes. So I remember that my uncle was here, and uh, another uncle came. Oh, because that's another thing. Forty-eight members of my family came at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the white, the white plains. It wow. was a lot of fun because I, we, <laughs> we didn't realize that we were so poor. So I remember on Wednesday night, my uncle that had a job, the first one that came, used to go out with the younger renovation because that's the day that they used to throw things out on the mm -hmm. streets. Trash day. Yeah, but the furniture, oh, okay. and at that time TVs that could work, 
So we used to do the scouting mm-hmm. all over the place, and, sure. and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the the Salvation Army, they had a house or they had a place when they used to sell mm-hmm. or close. But I didn't know what was Salvation Army. I just knew that my uncle used to call it. Let's go to the house in which when the people die, they sell their clothes. <laughs> So we used to call it in Spanish, La Casa de los Muertos. <laughs> the house of death. The, the house of death, okay? <laughs> so we used to go there and tie <laughs> everything on, that kind of a thing. So that's how oh. I, you know, the, even though I was working, yeah, because I, we had the commitment with my mom to save money to send to our father mm-hmm. and our brother in Cuba. Right. So my mother had to do jugglings with the job. Yeah to be able to save a little bit to send it down to Cuba. Yeah, I have, I have a number of questions just came into my head. Um, first, I want to ask you, you said, you mentioned that your uncle who moved here, who's a professor, doctor, you said he worked at the country club. Yeah, what as do? a waiter. As a waiter, right. So yeah. how do people... And he has a very interesting story. Yeah. He, I, I got my scholarship, oh, he was a waiter. And I got my... Very uh, well-educated waiter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got my my scholarship, and I, and I said to him, and you, with uh, your degrees, why don't you go back to school? Get your grades and do that. So I think that I was an inspiration for my uncle. He went to Mercy College, mm-hmm. and at that time they had a program for Cubans refugee mm-hmm. that you bring your mm, diplomas, and the, so he was able to convalidate all of you. And he just did two years there, and he became a Spanish teacher at Plenty, uh, Ple- uh, Pleasantville oh. Oh. High School. So Great. he retired from yeah. that. Wow. So he was able to do it, and so he was a little bit older. Is that something that is that happens to people who immigrate? Is that they have education? They try to they do many. They try to translate do. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a process, and uh, lucky, lucky. At that time, Mercy College had a program yeah. to uh, specializing in that. Right. And now they do it, but uh, I don't think that he paid that much money because they needed teachers at that time. Mm. So he became a teacher, and he was teaching for, I think, about 20 years there, and wow. then he retired from there. Mm. My other rest of the family, yeah. there was a White Plains Hotel there that now is the Esplanade. Mm-hmm. That was the hotel in town, luxury hotel. So one of my uncles was able to get in. So then the other ones came, and they got in, and they got in working and working. At the time, there was about 11 members of my family working as waiters, yeah. as um, you name it, you mm-hmm. name it, in the laundry room and everything, because some of them knew English, were the ones that were able to get a better job. Mm-hmm. And the ones that didn't know any English, you know, working with whatever, yeah. What about your uh, father and your brother? My father got sick in Cuba, and in 1968, they had to bring him because remember that my father was not a problem because my father was older oh, so right, they right. let him come but my he brother chose to stay with your brother yeah okay. my brother stayed behind mm-hmm. by himself mm. thank god that we had my grandmother on my mother's side there so they were able to help him to go and see him so he went to school he became a dentist he met somebody there and they married happily ever after mm-hmm. and uh, but Listen to this. He has a son, mm-hmm. and living in Havana, the kid saw that uh, he didn't want to stay in Cuba, that uh, he was able to listen to what was happening in the rest of the world. Yeah. So, 2000, I went there, uh, and I brought with me a lot of money, hidden money in my money belt, because he wanted to escape. Mm. But he wanted to escape in a very particular way. He wanted to escape because he was not allowed to leave the country as a dentist. However, if he could say that he was an accountant, they let accountants go. <laughs> How stupid. I mean, accountants are right, the ones yeah. that count the money. Count the money right? So, <laughs> with the money that I brought from here, yeah. he was able to, and which showed the corruption that the Cuban can pay everybody $200 here to change the seal, $500 to change the official paper saying that he was an accountant and like that, and he was able to go to Chile, mm. South America. Mm. 
and there he was able to get all his official documents to become a Chilean dentist. But then he went another step above mm -hmm. and he realized that there were not too many doctors with the specialty of implant. So mm -hmm. he became an implant doctor. In Chile. In Chile. Mm -hmm. And now he travels all over the world and he's fine. He comes to see me and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, you know, a very good success story, something that my brother was not able to do. He was the one that stayed behind. He became a dentist, as I said, and he's the head of a dental clinic in Havana. Mm -hmm. But, you know, doesn't know any English, so right now, even he can come in here now, but for him to begin here from square he's much number older, one, yeah. yeah. There he's a doctor. Right. He, he has a certain. Uh, a certain prestige, prestige a group of friends, uh, mm. uh, doctors from the University of Havana, another life. Right. And we sent him money, so, mm -hmm. you know. Well, things have changed with Cuba recently. Yeah. It's recent history. Yes, it has. Has that affected, um, how has that affected you? or? It hasn't affected me, and, uh, and I have been back to Cuba nine times. Oh, okay. And I have seen, I cannot... Nobody can tell me what's going on in Cuba. I have seen the island twice, from one side to the other one. And I can tell you that there are 11 million people suffering there. My brother belongs to the elite. There are two kinds of elite in Cuba. Mm -hmm. The professionals, mm -hmm. that they have people here, that they get money from here. And the members, three kinds of elite. The members of the Communist Party, that they are the ones that have the power and the control. Mm -hmm. And another group that is emerging now for the past 10, 15 years, people that went to school became engineers, uh, architects, mm -hmm. and they are the ones that are in, uh, um, in uh, economics, so, and they know English. Because right. now this new generation knows English, not the generation of my brother, the right. new generation. They didn't teach. And then they have being able to get jobs with foreign companies, oh. German companies, Mexican, not United States, so right. Mexican companies, Spanish companies, which that brings them to another level, mm -hmm. and they, they get paid in dollars. Right. So that's another class, okay? Mm. But 11 million people don't mm. have that. Uh, uh, I come from a little town next to Havana. When I came to this country, I had two groups of friends. The ones that I was hanging around with them all the time, that they wanted to come to the United States. But I knew a lot of people from school, and there were many in favor of the government mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. So they told me, why do you want to go to the United States? The only thing, and that was the pro communist propaganda at that time, you're, what you're going to be doing in that country is cleaning the toilets of the Americans, right. and you're going to be bitten by the dogs because they saw in the in the TV Cuban propaganda mm -hmm. with the African Americans at that um, time. Okay, right, the protests. So, and protests. Right. Oh my God! So you know mm -hmm. that's why I had this in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. So I never saw any dogs, and I never thank God had to do any cleaning of toilets. And sure. I, and I went back. Mm -hmm. I left in 1966, mm -hmm. and in 1979, Carter opened the doors for the Cuban Americans to go back and I go back there and I didn't want to talk because I was scared I just wanted to see my brother mm -hmm. but only to ask me what did you do what did what have you been doing this well I I just finished school I'm a teacher I am a teacher huh. I open up I, we open up a center to help immigrants like me so they put two and two together, and one of them at the end of the trip said, you know what, I can tell you this. Out of all of us, the ones that were in favor of the government, yeah. they said, you were the one that knew what you were doing. You were able to get out on time. Mm. These people, some of them went to school, the other ones didn't go to school, they got married, they had kids, mm -hmm. and everything else. Some of them don't even have teeth, so I'm, I am helping them to send in their money. Mm -hmm. So... They realized that Fidel Castro was something good for the revolution to get what he wanted, and then the reality not. It was not what he said it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So, right now, people are skeptical about Cuba because they don't want to believe in something, and then it falls down because of the Republicans and things like that. Mm -hmm. But they they have hope. Mm 
my brother tells me we have hope mm -hmm. and we have to see what's going to happen my brother said it cannot get worse than what it is right now what what are some of the things that make because so you're saying you know there's people in cuba who live in poverty and social mobility is a hard thing to achieve um, unless you belong to these different groups that i told you sure um right and so i think something some people would say about america is that <laughs> is that there are people who live in poverty and it's live hard to poverty, achieve social mobility. But they have food and they have food banks, the same food bank that we have in here. They have clothing there. Yeah. I have I'm seen... Ignorant, yeah, so, yeah, you know, I ha some. They have come, the people that come to me and they said, you see, today is a day that I haven't been able to eat anything because I, what, what I ate today was a little bit of uh, water with sugar and that's it. Talking about in Cuba. In Cuba. In Cuba. Um, when my first trip back, I left everything that I took with me. And the only thing that I came with was my dress. Right. I left even my underwear there for the people because they didn't have any panties. They didn't have any shoes. They didn't have anything. They have it. Wow. Makeup, everything, everything. You, you, is Yes. So, but now if you are a part of these classes or you have family, because remember that right now we are one million people in the United States. One million Cuban Americans. Now, you have relatives there, and uh, if you, you want to take care of, help your relative, you can take care of relatives. I have taken it upon myself. God has been so good to me mm. that I don't only take care of my brother, but I have friends, and I, they come, and I send them a check of $100 here, and I, when I go back, mm. I go with $1,000 in my pocket, and when I see need, I give them 20 here, but without anybody knowing it, very low key, because I don't want for them to think that I, you know, right. that's the reality yeah. there. Yeah. Yet every time that I go, uh, it brings me my beautiful memories of my family. Um, my country is still the place that I was born. This is my country now, mm -hmm. but it's a place that I was born, mm -hmm. a place that I was able to, to develop and at a very young age to see how life can change and how life can be so rough because we had it rough when we came to this country. Right. But now it's just to look back and to say, thank God that I am alive and thank God that I was able to challenge my energy in something that uh, I was able to, to see the product. Right, so, so you were saying that, um, you know, what we call poverty here is there's much more extreme version in Cuba, um, but what is your what is your experience of people coming to America, um, being able to um, like I guess I'll, I'll be frank like I'll be kind of blunt so um, people people might look at people who immigrate here and say like. Don't, don't they want like a higher standard of living? You know what I mean? Like, Everybody that, wants that. Right. You know, immigrants, immigrants are very hardworking people, not only Hispanics. You look back right. and you see that immigrants, because if you were born in this country, mm -hmm. you know that you're an American citizen and you're going to have some kind of a food on your table or food coupons or food stamps. On. All these immigrants that you see here, yes. many of them don't have paper. So you know that you have to work very hard to be able to achieve, and that's why you see all these right. this immigrants working in two jobs, mm. okay, two jobs. You're not, I'm talking about the Hispanic community. I sure. don't know that much about the other people. Sure. But I can see the Italians when they came to this country doing the same thing and the Irish people doing the same thing. You have to work very hard. Right. And that's what I see here in White Plains. Sometimes... We have the meetings on Sunday because people here work in two jobs. Right. They want to stay in White Plains because of the school system. Mm -hmm. Now we have so many programs. I, I should not say it, but probably they want to stay close to us because we are the ones that help them. But I am sure that the majority of the case is because of the school system, mm -hmm. because of the library in White Plains, mm -hmm. because we are, this city is very progressive, very proactive, and with all kinds of administrations. Republicans and Democrats, the city is very proactive and very progressive, and that's what people like about it. Right. They prefer to live in a room in White Plains, so they have their kids here, 
that to go to Porchester or to Terry Town, that it could they could have a better house, a beautiful house, but right. the system, the resources are not there. Yeah, ho- housing in White Plains seems to be something that is oh, it's challenging. Gonna, yeah, the people that are going to come and show they're going to talk about affordable housing there. Mm-hmm. Are there uh, obviously there's things going on in White Plains to create you know high end housing and skyscraper, you know the tall buildings and condos, luxury apartments. Are there things being done to maintain and create housing for low well, income? Well, people left here because of they were not affordable housing. Right. Uh, when the urban renewal tore down so many buildings. Right. And now, after 40 years, I can tell you that people are saying the same thing. Affordable housing. And we give lists of people that offer their, you know, they rent apartments, they rent things, and the prices are exorbitant which is white place, but yet they want to stay here. Mm-hmm. So so what are, what are people doing? They're living multiple families or multiple people? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Or just working very hard. To very, uh, working very right. hard. It's rare. has to be somebody that is already established, that got an education, that, that. But many people, they have their regular jobs during the day, and at night they clean office. You know how many... Buildings we have right here in White Plains, a lot of uh, places to work, cleaning office. Right. So, so, but they don't want to live. They want to stay here. And, uh, but it's a hardworking community. I can tell you mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's right. If you stop and look for a second, yeah. you'll see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what else? Uh, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there's more. Let's see. Um, I mean, it's funny, the question that I so often ask people is what makes White Plains special? Like that, that was a question that I've been asking each person, but you brought that up on, on, on my own. Yeah. <laughs> because I believe it did. Right. I would never think of any other place in the United States that I move, move that is not here. Mm-hmm. I'm ha- getting to hate the winters in here, so if I have a chance, January yeah. or February, I will be out of here, but I am yeah. here and I have to stay here. Mm-hmm. But this is a place to me. I mean, not because... Mayor Roach gave me a street or anything like that. That's the way. And at the beginning, I hated it. I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. The first 10 years, not 10 years, from 1966 until I graduated from college in 72, I told you, I went through such a big identity crisis because I could not relate to what was happening. I went to college and I was able to find Cubans just like me. Mm-hmm. They like music and they like things. So mm-hmm. everything began moving along a little bit. Mm-hmm. But then I used to go and visit all my friends. Remember my Cuban friends that I had in Cuba that were ready to come to the United States? Yes. All of them went to Miami. Oh. All <laughs> of them. Eight, nine, ten of them. Right. right. However, the difference is, and I love them dearly, and every time that I go to them, I, yeah. I am with them, and they come and say my house, and they surprise me to come with the street because I didn't know anything about it and I almost had a heart attack. (laughs) But, you know, they stay in the Cuban-American community and they decided that they didn't want to further their education. So they didn't go back to school here. So, you know, I was the only one out of the whole group. Probably because I came up in New York and I said, I'm going to make it or kill myself in here. But the first 10 years in here, they were difficult because I just always wanted to go back to Miami yeah. and live in Miami. And my mother said, no, we don't have the, you don't have the opportunities that you have in here. My mother used to tell me that. Yeah. You have to get an education and get it here because this is New York and New York is New York. Yeah. And your degrees are going to be better from any university accredited here that you should go to any other schools. Right. So I stay. So she... Um do you, do you still see like do you, so you see education as the only a way keystone? to succeed in this country? Yeah. Especially for an women. Now, if you inherit a lot of money, right. you don't have well, to worry well, about it. But who is able to? So yes, <laughs> yes. Who is able to do that? Right. But for everybody, I think that we have to be always very proactive and think that without education, not only in this country. In all the countries in the world, the people that are better off in Cuba, besides the ones that are 
in the political party that right. many of them don't even know where they stand in education, mm. but they're part of the party. Right. They're the ones that have been educated. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And in not only in the United States, all over the world, if you have an education, it's just one of those things that you can hang on the wall, even though you don't know anything about <laughs> it. That's, right. yeah. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So. And you, you said that you went to Manhattan, though, right? So, and that, that was a Catholic institution? The first two years, yes, yeah, Sacred Heart. The first okay. two years was a Sacred Heart. Yeah. Uh, but then the, and they were only girls. Mm -hmm. But then the last two years, they made it co-ed. And, and you've been a member of the church here for, for all this time, right? Yeah. I'm the right, I have been the director of the choir all the time. I don't get any pay mm -hmm. for that. But uh, you know, Ben, that has been with the center and with the church, that has been the way for me to give back to this country that has given me so much. What is it about like the church that binds people or you know, brings people together? Is it? Well, it's, it's, if you believe in God, and I am going to tell you something that I learned. In Cuba, I was very Catholic, but um, I was Catholic because of tradition. Okay. Because my family was Catholic and that was sure. the thing to do, to wear a new dress every Sunday to go to church, to sing in the choir, because I was already singing in the choir there. I began singing in the choir at 15. Mm. So, but when I came here, my religion gave me the, as I said before, the refuge, the hope, the belief in God. Yes. I just need my computer mouse. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Sorry. Okay, let's just wait. Okay. Let's just go okay. pick it up. Did you turn it off? No. Okay. So we'll, we'll just, okay. I'll cut it out. So the, 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 the refuge, the hope, and, and the belief, uh, I became that I was Catholic because of my convention, not because the tradition that I had because I needed God in my life. Mm -hmm. And I have been very ill, and God has been on my side, and um, of course I helped God treating, you know, going to slow catering and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but my religion mm -hmm. has been very important in my life. Mm -hmm. And it, is it something that, uh, you said it's something that all, well, that almost all Spanish-speaking immigrants have in common, right? Is that they're Catholic. They're Catholics, but not everybody's Catholic. Uh, you know, many, uh, many of them, not many, a percentage are Christian, which means that they are Protestants from uh, any other, but they're Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't, you don't, I don't have, there was a, a, a community of Jewish people in Havana, about 5,000 to 10,000. Mm -hmm. There was a community of um, Arab people but they were people that emigrated from their countries and came to Cuba because at that time, um, the beginning of the century and the last century, Cuba was the place to be because it had the sugar, it has the, the tobacco, the rum, and then there were jobs. I mean, right. there were many jobs. In my hometown, that it was only 24,000 people, we had so many Chinese uh, little bodegas and uh, uh, dry cleaners and uh, Polish people, Jewish, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with uh, clothing stores. Wow. But you know what? I always saw them as Cubans, but I never even said Cubans because mm -hmm. we were all Cubans and right, we didn't right. have to say you're Cuban. No, no. Right. I saw the difference when I came to this country that I, I got into this melting pot that I realized that I oh, was that's Cuban. interesting, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see myself there as that because everybody was the same. So you you mean that people here maintain their their nationality or maintain their, their cultural yes, background? Yes, they Strong. do. Yeah, Strong. it's stronger. It could be that that was small, but uh, I used to say, oh, I'm going to go to this Chinese, I used to say a Chinese store, but that was a way of recognizing that I was going, but not that he was Chinese and I was Cuban. I never realized that I was Cuban. At yeah. all. That was not <laughs> part of my vocabulary until I came to this country. <laughs> because then I was different right. than everybody else around me. Yeah. Which, you know, I told my brother that he could not 
Yeah, 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 because here everybody was the same and we didn't see anybody different, that kind of a thing. Yeah, because yeah, in, in America, kids are very self-consciously American, you know, like you're proud to be an American. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. It's something you're raised with. But well, well, the yeah. same way that I was raised, but in my case, that I am a Cuban never came into our vocabulary. We are what we are and we take what we are. Right. Yeah. When we came to this country, that's when I realized that I was coming from Cuba, from an island, that kind of a thing. Hmm. Hmm. Have you ever been in a, in a plane that is only a propel? Uh, not like a real little one, no. <laughs> That's the uh-huh. plane that I came from Havana yeah. to Miami, hmm. and it was one of those planes that would I was so scared, and I was crying so much, crying so much. But it's been a long time. Did you, when you got to America, did you, how did you get from Miami to New York? Well, because uh, the government paid us a plane ticket. Oh. And we came, and then when we got to the airport, my famous uncle was waiting for us. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you an anecdote. I came on uh, November 9th, 1966, coming from Cuba, everything green the whole year. I get to White Plains, mm. and I see it like this. Mm-hmm. No leaves on the trees. Yeah. And uh, I see mountains of uh, leaves like this. <laughs> and in Cuba, they used to do that with the sugar cane, uh-huh. and then they used to burn it. Right, right. So I was just waiting for people to burn those <laughs> things. And then I saw big machines like this taking the leaf out, and I said, well, then it dawned on me that we have four seasons in here. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what is the other anecdote? Uh, New York, and when you think about your New York and White Plains, you think everything is the same thing. You think it's New York City, you mean? So, right. when we got to my uncle's house, the first night we went to bed, and the following day, I asked my uncle, I want to see you outside. So, he said, oh, yeah, go out. So then, I began doing like this. So, he comes out and said, what are you looking at? I said, well, I'm looking, where, where? Looking for the Empire State, State Building. <laughs> so, oh, oh, we are far from that. <laughs> then I walked on Ferris Avenue at the end, and you know that there is a cemetery there. So I never knew that there was a cemetery hmm. because in Cuba the cemeteries are mausoleos above the ground, oh. and you know that it's a cemetery. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't look like a cemetery. So we used to. And I was the oldest of my cousins, and I saw, told you that everybody was coming. Yes. And we used to go and play in the cemetery yes. and things like that. You know, I saw the crosses, but, you know. Right. So when my uncle comes, where have you been? I said, well, we were playing in that in park, park thing. <laughs> That's a cemetery. <laughs> oh, so many things that happened to us. And, I mean, in White Plains at that time, wasn't a, didn't have the building no. it has now. Main Street. Yeah. Main Street was not the building. Main Street, um, my family used to love the concept of shopping uh, one thing a week and going from store to store. Mm-hmm. So in that place, there was the fruit place, the butcher, the this and that. The only building that I remember that was in the place that is Caramba mm-hmm. was a Woolworth store, department store. department store yeah. in that place. So, but everything else was little stores and little places. I, mm-hmm. I, I am sorry that I didn't take pictures of how White Plains looked at that time, but it was, you know, very small, very, then after that, that's when everything began getting big. Right. Uh, That's a part of White Plains history that I'm really interested in, is urban renewal and the numerous projects. You know who you have to talk with? Who's that? Sue Havel. Sue Havel used to be the planning department, and she, together with... uh, um, together with Delfino at that time were the ones that, you know, Renaissance, they built the city and build this. And she mm-hmm. would be able to go one project after the other project and the times that they were built because she's a mm-hmm. brilliant woman. So reach out to her. I will. Were there, were there parts of White Plains that you didn't walk through or? Afraid? Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never in my life. I was not afraid. Mm-hmm. Not even when I was, uh, didn't have a car. Anyway. I mean, I, I was living in the Ferris Avenue. Right. Man, got along with everybody, didn't have any problem, never afraid. Hmm. I am not afraid at all, you know. Hmm. But um, 
but for me it was difficult to understand that such a great country that we were coming, it was going through such a big turmoil right. in the 60s. Right. You know, when I went to school, I learned what happened and why everything was happening. But uh, number one, if that happens in Cuba, they bring 2,000 soldiers and they put everybody in jail. No, no consideration of anything. And right. if they had to kill 200 people doing that, that's it. He said, so they had the right uh, to do it. Right. Well, that's right. And, and so that must have been a pretty powerful perspective. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. I, that's what I thought. That's a good point that you're saying that. I said, well, at least they have the freedom to do it. Mm-hmm. I had to leave my country because I was going to church and I never got to do anything like that. If I do something like that, I would have been dead in the in the uh, firing. How do you say fire? firing squad? Yeah. That they had it. They had it. We have people in our hometown that they disappear mm. in, from one day to the other. Right. And then they were dead. Mm. So it was a, you know, it's very interesting now that we are talking. They, many of the new generation, they love Ernesto Che Guevara. Right. You know that he was one of the worst murders that we have in Cuba during the revolution. That people were in jail, and if by any chance they were trying to torture them to get information about the Contra Revolution, and if the, he didn't like the way the guy answered, he would kill them right there, cold blood. Mm. And there are books about it. Mm. And yet he became. You know, like an icon. Icon, you're right. right. So, hmm. I was there with uh, the Bay of Pigs, 1961. And uh, suddenly, three or four days before, I am sitting in my porch in my house, and I began seeing a caravan of uh, government trucks, green and covered. And one of them, looked like a the fuselage mm-hmm. of a plane mm-hmm. and then I found out that they were rockets mm-hmm. and they were taking it to the place in which the invasion was going to take place. Mm-hmm. Castro knew before it happened that that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So what they did in my hometown, okay, they put in jail before the invasion all the males that they thought that they were going to create problems for the government. Right. My father was already older, so they didn't take him. But my two un- uncles, and they came to the house, they knocked on the door, said, you come with me. And they put them in a jail in Havana, in the center of the city. They were there for 10 days until we had the invasion, it was a failure and everything else, and right. then they let them go. because and I am sure that in the same way that they did that in my hometown, yeah. in all the little towns, they did the same thing because they realized that the male, younger male, were going to be the first one. Yeah. 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 So they knew all about it. Everything was hmm. a massacre. Hmm. And I can tell you from my own experience that I saw it. I am not telling you anything that I have not seen. And uh, Right, so in... Uh, that kind of that level of like political uh, conflict or fighting, right? Is, it's not really something that we've exactly seen you know, in America. Right? We haven't had a revolution or something in America. Um, well, you had. We have a revolution here, but you know, it was a different kind of revolution. But that what, kind what of a violence, uh, that yeah. kind of an abuse, yeah. you know, kill people right in jail, not giving them a right to to, to do, you know, and torture them, torture them. Well, there we go. It's been in the news lately. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. In Cuba, but Americans in Cuba, in Guantanamo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So So that's another, that's another irony. irony, But but, uh, but I can tell you of what I know and what I saw Hmm. and... uh, I lived there for the first um, six years of communism, and believe me, it was very brutal. I can tell you, my grandfather used to own a farm 
and he used to have a jeep to go to the farm uh, every single morning at five o'clock in the morning. So one day he gets there, and once he's going to open the doors, there are about 20 members of the Communist Party and the soldiers with uh, machine guns. I mm. said, now you go back to town walking. We keep your jeep and we keep your land. Just mm. there. Then, three months later, he died of a heart attack. Mm. So that's the kind of abuse that that happened. Mm. So, but I don't want to talk about Cuba. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in, you know, people's impression of White Plains and, like, the, the changes that have happened, like, with, with urban renewal, which we started to talk about and kind of got derailed, but, um, and about whether, not so much in a simplistic way about, like, whether you think it's better now than it was then, because it's never that black and white, sort of, but what you think, sort of, the benefits are to White Plains as it is now, with it's bigger well, buildings. You see, but in all society, you have to change. You have to get used to change. Uh, it's very sad, sad to go back. I'm sorry that I have to compare it, to go back to my hometown and know that time has not passed there. Everything is the same as it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. You don't see technology. You don't see improvement. And that's what society wants, to see improvement, to see technologies. Um, I don't know if I would agree so many tall buildings, but so what? That's a that's, uh, development. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to stay behind? I mean, and White Plains has been very pro in everything. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I don't like now is to see so many empty stores. That's yes. something that I don't, know, I don't like it, but you know, mm -hmm. I guess uh, that is the, the pains of growing, so whatever you want to call it. But uh, uh, before it was more. Um, smaller, less people, and that kind of a thing now has become, I mean, the head of the county, and you know right. this better than myself, during the night, we sleep here 57,000, but at, during the day, right. Still. a lot of people. <laughs> so I, I see the changes in a very progressive matter. The only thing that I would like to see is more affordable housing, mm -hmm. and more jobs accessible to the people. Mm -hmm. Here you have the cleaning jobs, very low, and then you have the professional jobs. But in between, it's hard to find jobs like that. Uh, thank God that we have a lot of restaurants, service, uh, you know, like stores, and people get jobs with that, but you don't make that much money with that. So. And are those jobs that people want to have for their whole life, or, you know, are those careers, or are those jobs? Do you that, see that's hard to say, but people uh, would like to have more, find more places in which they can be trained, hmm. uh, to, you know, the one that likes to be a carpenter, carpenter, mm -hmm. they like to be in the union, but, you know, to go to one of those union, you, is Have to know someone, yeah, put in time. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, but I still see, I think that on Sunday when people come, I'm going to say that better jobs mm. and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. That's something that is stays there. And the school system is fine. The yeah, school, schools in White Plains are, everyone, everyone generally agrees the schools in White Plains. Yeah. Are, are the schools in White, how are the schools in White Plains coping with the linguistic shift? Yeah, they're very, they're sure that's why I said that they're very, doing a very good job trying to educate our kids. 55% of the population in the school system, they're Hispanic. Right. And they're able to help more. Of course, you're gonna have kids that are gonna drop out, you're gonna have kids that are gonna come uh, from Latin America with uh, problems and problems, but uh, in the majority, they're doing a good job. Yeah. It's not like this kid is taken to Bronzeville School. They are very good at what they do, but if they're not able to deal with the kid one-to-one, -one, it's a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So in White Plains, they do a good job, and we help them a lot. Right. I'm going to give you, before you go, an annual report so you can see what we do and some okay. of the things that I have. Anything else? No, I think, I think yeah. that was a good interview, so I'll shut off the recording. Yeah.